Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to the Blocks of Bag show. I'm your boy, Beach. I'm your boy, Seb. And as you guys know, this is a podcast where you can get everything business, creator, and tech. This week's episode is all around building businesses internationally, helping other people get into business, and just being a strong woman who knows what she likes, knows what she doesn't like, um, and more importantly, is someone who wants to impact other people. This week's guest is none other than Izzy Bang. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we do the show a bit differently. Um, some episodes we go into deep dive, some episodes we chat with friends, and some episodes we chat with icons. Um, hopefully at the end of this episode, you'll be somewhere between friend and icon. But um, it's well documented, the impact that your business founder Vine has had on the UK ecosystem. You're now building in Ghana as well and looking at the world, which I'm so impressed and so happy to see. As I remember when I started doing business and I, and I was a young entrepreneur, I was one of two people in my class who wanted to do business. Now when I go into schools, and I literally was in a school this morning, you ask kids who wants to be an entrepreneur, who wants to be an owner, who wants to be a creator, and majority, you know, people have learned this stuff and I feel like communities such as the ones I've built, but more importantly the ones that you built, um, act as a great pathway for telling stories and giving opportunity. Um, so I wanna just thank you and give you your flowers for coming on the show. Thank you. No, that's really positive to hear. And I think that I've watched you for several years now. And when we last saw each other, I said, uh, it's about time we sat down together. So it's really great to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about impact and inclusion and building more spaces for entrepreneurs as well. Absolutely. Um, and right now, we have just come out of witnessing you guys do your first award show legendary you had the red calf here you had sponsors everyone was dressed up to the t looking great um we filmed the vlog you can watch the episode here um it's already out i'm doing that youtube thing <laughs> <laughs> but you can watch the episode here now guys and um no, we had a blast um i think something that was poignant uh that you guys said at the uh, the award show was that you're giving the platform and the space for those behind the scenes, mm. those that don't always get the flowers all the time, whilst also mixing with those that people do know. Um, that felt like a very important element as when me and Seb are building what we're building here at Blocks of Bags, we're always thinking about operators, not just the founder, the investor and the star. Um, so to warm ourselves up, Seb and I have prepared a couple of questions just to get us going. But um, in this episode, we don't wanna just talk about the business, we wanna talk about the vision, the future, and also maybe some some opportunities you see for people. Because if someone's sitting here wanting to be like one of us here on stage, I think it's important to to give free game. So Seb, do you want to fire away with some some yeah, questions? Yeah, let's get started. So your journey in building Foundervine has been over a couple of years, and I wanted to ask you, like, what keeps you motivated to keep on pushing for like excellence? Because everything I see is like excellent. So. First question is, what keeps you motivated? I love that. No, I appreciate that it comes across that way because we do work really hard at Foundervine. And, you know, I think about the beginning of the journey. So uh, before starting Foundervine, um, I was a management consultant for all my sins. And um, I spent a lot of time working with people who just approached everything to a certain standard. And I think sometimes there's a sense um, in our communities about the kind of quality of the types of organizations that are being started. And when you hear social enterprise in particular, people have this kind of assumption that it's a little bit janky, it's a little bit kind of, you know, volunteer led, it doesn't really have much process, much system. And it was so important that we applied a lot of the same principles that corporates do and that larger organizations do into our tiny volunteer-led startup. Um, and so it's something that I find a lot of people find. They're like, oh, I'm gonna join Foundervine because it looks great and you guys are doing all this stuff. And then they come in and they're like, oh, this is very corporate. And um, that's a really kind of big thing for us. So I think the, the short answer to that is that in terms of staying motivated, I'm really nerdy about systems and strategy and 
how we can kind of build things and achieve things at scale. I'm always thinking about everything much bigger than it is. Um, and it just means that we take a very different approach to how we're doing. It, it could be good, but it can be better. And I always say to the team, okay, like this is good, but how can we make this better? Or how can you make yourself better so we can do this better? And that's just the kind of culturally a mentality that we've built um, within Found Divine and one that I hold internally as well quite strongly. And I love that. I think that's definitely something a lot of entrepreneurs <clears throat> can kind of take on even when they've started building their business. Something me and BJ always talk about is just excellence and standards even when nobody's like watching and building things like properly from the kind of beginning I love processes systems strategies and as you said that's the secret to helping you scale right um next question you've achieved so much we see you chilling at Downing Street um <laughs> what keeps you grounded what keeps me grounded um so I I grew up in a very humble environment and I think that it's really interesting because I've been hearing a lot about how fashionable it is to say like you grew up working class nowadays, particularly amongst politicians. Oh, like, shout you know, out, shout out Victoria Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Victoria Beckham like refusing to talk about her dad's car. Like <laughs> Rolls Royce. <laughs> there we go. And you see a lot with politicians as well. Like they are just fighting each other to who can have grown up in the most humble background, all of that kind of stuff um but i think like from my perspective it 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 grounds me actually having grown up with the experiences that i've had and knowing what it's like to not have much and to have to actually really hustle your way through and um i see a lot of the the, the struggles that my parents had in terms of navigating you know uh, their own journeys uh, moving to the UK in the 80s and having to navigate a lot of things that we didn't have to go through in order to bring themselves up and it just it, it, it can't help but make me grounded and so even though I'm in spaces now like you said that are very different you know whether that's like Downing Street or a lot of the um the corporate partners we work with I always just I always realize I'm not too far away from that um, and I still I still live in the same place like I still um, very much kind of like my, my family are still in a kind of similar energy to how I grew up and so yeah I think I, I think it keeps me grounded realizing that um, even though you know I'm doing all of this I'm not a different person I'm still I'm still the same yeah. I love that. And um, a lot of us have come from um, backgrounds where we've either got parents that have migrated or we've migrated ourselves mm. here. And I always have a conversation with my mom. Um, she she migrated. I, I was also a migrant as well, but we, we both face very different kind of challenges. Me growing up here with the school, school system, having a, a grasp on English and that kind of thing. But I always tell her that I've also had challenges as well. It's not been easy for me. Like, being able to like navigate different spaces, going from school or college to like university where I'm surrounded by a completely different set of people. So I wanted to ask you, what are some of the challenges that you face that might not be like so obvious to, to people out there? Because it, it all seems like the entrepreneurial journey always seems like nice and rosy, but, but what are some of those challenges? Yeah, and it's so dangerous that people paint it like that. You know, that narrative about the, you know, entrepreneur, they just kind of worked hard. And, you know, even though they faced this thing, they, they just like miraculously brought themselves up. But the reality is um, it's always much different to that, isn't it? It's kind of like less uh, linear path and more just like jungle gym. Um, and I think we owe a responsibility to our communities, to be honest, about the... The, can I swear? If you want, that's your brand. <laughs> I, I love that. Oh wow. Okay, no, so I won't swear on you. I'll respect the no, the no, podcast. People, people but, sworn, but so um no, so uh, I people. I might say friggin' sometimes. Like it gets me friggin' mad. Friggin', friggin', friggin mad. Friggin' mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kids, the kids, the kids might be watching, isn't it? The, <laughs> the height of your swearing is friggin'. <laughs> <laughs> really but obviously in real life I like, haven't actually heard you st you know, I don't think you speak okay much, you, you know, know what I'm going to respect okay. the energy Um, so I think that it's important for us to 
to just show the failures and show the things that don't work as well as as well as the really high highs um and so in terms of challenges you know there's 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 so much that you have to figure out in the beginning and it's 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 interesting thinking about where i am now where i've got this community of people who are giving me my flowers but in the beginning it's not like that it's mm -hmm. it's you it's the it's the grind it's mm -hmm. figuring it out it's validating your concepts it's getting other people to come on board and that was really hard um it navigating what it meant to uh, start a start a business, start a social enterprise as someone who didn't necessarily come from within the startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. and um, doing that with not having a huge amount of money at all. Um, and I was 24 when um, when I started Foundervine, and you know, at that time, there was a lot of people that were just like, "Oh, but this this person over here is doing that thing. Why would you do that thing?" And you have to just be so committed to your vision like almost like d d deliriously deludedly is deludedly a word we'll make it, it, it is now, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> i'm sure there's a better word for that but you have to be always deluded in terms of how much you're backing yourself yeah. in I think, order I think to Smith be able always to says um to quote smith because again the smiths yeah. are in the news right now again but the, he said something quite poignant on a video years ago that i saw and it's a uh, you need to be like absolutely obsessed with what you're trying to do and fall forward, like feel the fear and fall forward. And it's that kind of dedication that really drives you to kind of like wean out the noise and actually get building steps. And oftentimes when you look back, you're like, oh, look how far I've come. But in the moments, it doesn't feel like you've done much. Mm. But when you do look back, it's like, okay, we've come a long way. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely hear that. And you kind of hear variations of people saying kind of failure is just kind of a learning opportunity. And, you know, a lot of success is just that collection of failures. And it's so much more important what you do with it and the resilience that you build and how you use it to either pivot or kind of navigate change. Um, and, you know, just going back to what we do at Foundervine, I think one of the most powerful things about accelerators and joining them is that we actually create spaces in which you can fail safely yeah. and test and experiment and do it with people who have kind of been there and done that um and i think that's so important especially when you're at those earlier stages where it can be quite lonely as well yeah loneliness that's a thing that i can definitely relate to it comes in in different waves you can be with so many people and be lonely you can be alone and be lonely loneliness doesn't always just mean uh have one definition in my perspective. Um, when have you felt lonely as an entrepreneur? Because you've got a co-founder as well, um, who's a COO and does amazing stuff and you do what you do as well. But like, yeah, when have you felt lonely in your career and how have you overcome it? Yeah, so um, loneliness is a big thing for any CEO in that the buck does stop with you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how many people you have in your team. It doesn't matter how many things you've got going on. The buck stops with you. And I found that, you know, much of the challenge that I have is, uh, is trying to empower others to do great work mm -hmm. and being part support system for them if things aren't going so well. And also having to kind of, drive them as much as possible to make sure things do go well. But when it comes to me and what I have to do, if I'm spending more time in the business, having to kind of fight fires and troubleshoot, there's less time that I can spend on the business. And if I'm not spending time on the business, then I'm doing a disservice to the company. I'm not actually driving us forward as effectively as I can in terms of our vision. And ultimately it can have just like such a longer term impact that I will feel more than anyone. If I'm yeah. not bringing in money to the business, that's me. If yeah. people aren't paid that month, that's me. If our clients are unhappy, that is me. And so there's a kind of a, you know, you know, they, they say heavy is the head. And I think it's so true. Like, you know, if you're wearing the crown, you just have to, you just have to roll with it. Um, and you're feeling what you feel, but you suppress it in that moment and you move forward. Whereas someone who's reporting into you or reporting into them, there's somewhere they can go with that energy to offload. And so 
I think it can be it can be really hard to kind of find um, find a balance and find the spaces in which you can um, be soft when you otherwise have to be quite hard mm. sometimes um, as a chief exec. Yeah. So with that, because that's a yeah a very true point you've made there, um, and there loads of times I wanted to play horns and and beep sounds, but we might do that with the the clicks later. But um, how I've like you know, taking what you said there and implemented it in different teams I've had is coaching, you know, bringing in executive coaches um, to support me and give me a bit of space for me to just have that one-on-one -on -one battlefield. Um, I know Andy, I am a big fan of like your personal board of advisors and a few other friends talk about that. So like, even if you don't have a formal board, but like who's that circle of people and who have different expertise you can chat to. Um, and then, you know, now I'm getting a lot more familiar with actually having a board you report to obviously a CEO of a charity and there's trustees there. So leaning on different expertise there as well. So I know you sit on boards. I know you've also got boards around you. Um, would you have, would you say that coaching has been something that's been useful or having a board? Like what are some tools that some people could utilize um, to level up and give themselves self space? Cause there is a solo founder out there or someone who's got a growing business that's listening cause it's evergreen content we're making. And I want them to understand that there's options. Absolutely. Um, I always I always think about uh, the importance of having kind of concentric concentric circles of support as a founder. And when you are when you are a founder or when you're starting that journey, that kind of the, the core of it, the nucleus is you and you being the most effective support system for yourself. And then the kind of ring outside of that is that immediate team you have around you who are in the trenches helping you do that work then the ring around that is your sort of stakeholders so the clients the partners the suppliers all those people that give you the energy whether that's kind of money or otherwise to do the work that you do and then there's that concentric the last circle is the community you have around you and it's so important to build that before you need it mm. Uh, it's so interesting you mention um, Andy I am and I think about how you know before I started Founder Vine I would consume his content I'd engage with the, the the videos and the blog posts he put out and I really felt the beginning of that community starting to build for me because I'd I'd had this interest in starting a business and I didn't know where to start yeah um, and then, you know, he went on to to build backstage and it created a real sense of community amongst um, founders in different ways. I have a coach who's absolutely brilliant and she is fantastic at holding me accountable and getting me to question my own uh, rubbish sometimes, um, just kind of unpacking a lot of things. And I think that, like you said, it's so important to get outside of your head. So as a founder, thinking through how you can build uh, coaching capacity and being very clear on the distinction between having a coach who can help you uh, answer your own questions and having a mentor who is there to, you know, leverage their own experience to help you understand how to navigate whatever space that you're in. Ideally, you should have at least one of each. Agree. And then that kind of broader piece you mentioned around that community that you can just send a quick voice note to or you can pick up the phone to when you're feeling something. It just makes all the difference in terms of your mental health, in terms of your ability to navigate the the tides of growing a business. Um, and then also just kind of keeping you safe from you know challenges that come you know people who want to take advantage of you or kind of clients that aren't working out all of those kinds of things just community is so so important and it sounds like I'm doing a lot of quick plugs with Founder Vine, but that's another thing that we do quite well I think in that we we bring people together who can who can essentially be a support system for each other mm. as well as the kinds of stakeholders that can help them navigate those tides whether those are funders or potential partners or buyers that kind of thing um, because we recognize that is so important just as much as the kind of training and knowledge that we provide on our programs as well love that i love that so <clears throat> i wanted uh, to talk to you quickly about leadership so I've worked under many different CEOs and business leaders and I've come across like so many different styles and archetypes. 
from the maverick to the all in kind of guy to the more relaxed kind of product guy um what is number one you're not even a guy you're you, you're a girl <laughs> you're a woman and like a guy. <laughs> number two is like the, the question is how would you describe your leadership style because whenever i come across your content you always seem so calm and kind of like so well put together and i'm like it's refreshing to see like a ceo that's not like shouting all over the place and i wanted to ask you about your leadership style and then to what advice or gems do you have for business leaders of tomorrow what kind of things do they need to um, equip themselves with i would say that as a leader you have a few key roles your first role is to build a cohesive strategy and a vision for the organization that your people can get behind. Your second role is to make sure that there's enough money in the bank to keep the lights on. Absolutely. And then your third role is to step back and let them get on with it. And that's how I would describe my style of leadership. And, you know, it's not really for me to say, I think it's for the people around me to say, but I like to think that I take a, a servant approach to leadership in that, I think it's important to build the, the the infrastructure that means that people can work effectively and they can be empowered to do their work and then just let them get on with it. Trusting that you've got the right talent in place to make the right decisions, high quality decisions that mean that the, you know, that you're, you're not a blocker essentially. And it's so interesting you mentioned the different kinds of leaders because I also have seen all of the types yeah. of leaders. <laughs> I've I've been led by people who have been very autocratic, very um, authoritative, have clearly not trusted effectively. I've worked with people who have been very lax and have been unclear and not really set direction and kind of let you, they, they're, they're empowering you by letting you get on with it, but they're throwing you in in the, the, the deep end and the sharks in the water. That's not empowering. That is, that's just like putting people in danger. And so I really think it's important to kind of create a safe space in which people can be empowered. And that means you've built an effective infrastructure. You've you've created boundaries between uh, the client and the challenges that they have, for example, and the, the inner team. So they're, they're, they're blocked from a lot of that. You know, you've created barriers in terms of people not needing to build a whole process every time they do something new. No, they know the process is there, it works, and they can kind of actually just focus on doing great work. And so that's that's that kind of piece around systems thinking as well. I think it's, I think it's so important, that piece around strategy building. Because if you're not able to effectively do that as a leader, you're essentially throwing your team to the wolves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be very destructive sometimes. So I hope that answers your question. It does, actually, it does. Um, Talking about throwing to the wolves, or the lion, <laughs> or you know, whatever is out there in nature. You're someone who, I'd say, you're bilingual. Do you speak more than one, two, one languages? I you, you talk, you talk, you speak I three? speak tree, yeah, but yes, I, I do. Okay. I'm gonna own that. I do. Yes, um, and it's well documented online that you're out trying to build an ecosystem in Ghana. You're actively putting events out, and I'm loving seeing. The bits, um, the bits you do show us, because I'm, I'm sure there's so much we don't see as well. Um, but tell me the difference in doing business here versus Africa, in your opinion, as someone who does live across the blue country, not someone who just pops over in December for two weeks. Daddy decided. <laughs> <laughs> because I have dreams and aspirations of going to Africa and building back at Congo, but also yeah. in other countries. And I'm, from the research and conversations I've been having, I just know that I can't have a a London mindset. Oh, I'm going to bring this solution. I need to be yeah. on the ground doing stuff. And as someone who's on that, that transition, what have the differences been? And then let's unpack it with a couple more questions, I think. Yes. Yeah, so I moved to Ghana four years ago and I moved out there for completely personal reasons. Um, I wanted to live a softer life. Um, Soft life. I, I, I did. I did. And, and has, it been, um, has it been achieved? It has been successfully achieved, I have to say. Uh, Ghana, it, it, it moves as a different tempo. Uh, she has her challenges, but we love her. Um, and, and the challenges are great. Like Ghana is going through 
a uh, significant economic downturn at the moment. Uh, economic growth is slowed. People are frustrated. People are protesting in the streets. Hyperinflation has meant that people's salaries are, you know, less than half in, in real terms than they were just two years ago. It hasn't recovered from the pandemic. And so trying to uh, sort of build a business in that context is always going to be quite difficult. So I uh, moved out there four years ago and what I immediately noticed was just the, sh the sheer talent that is out there. Um, the number of fantastic graduates who are graduating from really great universities with great degrees, but struggling to find jobs in the local market, struggling to find meaningful jobs that could actually test their skills, give them the competencies to compete on the global market. It's a real, real high graduate unemployment issue. Um, at the same time, you've got um, the fact that Ghana is on the same time zone as the UK um, and has generally okay internet access. And so, you know, working with a team out there felt like a no brainer, especially since COVID it, where people became a lot more comfortable working um, in remote teams. And we've always been kind of a, a hybrid team. And so it's been a really interesting journey for us to uh, start building a team out there. And we've gone from just one person to 11 people today working in our Ghana office, um, which is in Osu and Accra. Um, and then we have our team um, of around kind of 17, 18 people working in our London office in Canary Wharf. And I would say that the teams work really, really well together. We've shown that it can work. We've shown that we can provide opportunities and jobs in uh, an economy that really needs them. Mm. Um, and I'm really excited to see that team grow and expand in terms of what it can do for us. Um, alongside building talent in Ghana, um, for the last three years, we've been running a program uh, focused on helping young people build digital skills in Ghana. Um, you know, graduate unemployment is a challenge, but if you go years back, some of the bigger challenges are that a lot of young people simply don't have the the resources and the support to uh, build STEM skills, mm -hmm. which are exactly the kinds of skills we need for a growing digital economy. And so the Ghana Science and Technology Explorer Prize, GSTEP, has been a program that we've been running out there. And it's today, if I'm not mistaken, supported 14,000 young people across Ghana to build these skills and we've you know we've we've hosted competitions around the country um we've even presented some of our finalists in front of the president of Ghana mm -hmm. which we're really proud of um and it's kind of testament to I think you know you mentioned being Congolese diaspora it's a testament to what the diaspora can do if Absolutely. we go back what you said about not assuming that your skills and your knowledge is what the country needs is exactly what I did for the first two years in country I I didn't assume I knew anything I didn't try to impose the way we do things in the UK in Ghana I just listened I got to know people I built relationships and wow, so wow, wow. let's break that down yeah you just said you listened for two years people get itchy feet I need to make money. I need to move. Need to do so, yeah. Obviously, you got like you had London revenue coming in. Yeah. But break that down a bit, a bit more down for us. I had London revenue coming in, but again, let's talk about the realities of starting a business. I left a really well-paying job mm -hmm. to essentially um, minimum wage when you're running your first it, business. I don't yeah. think it was minimum wage. I think I was on less <laughs> Below. Than minimum wage. You know, yeah. what I, you know what I realized recently as well. I was like, I did a quote. I've been doing this ten plus years. How many years have I actually maxed out on my actual holiday allowance? Oh, Barely. I've never done that. Barely. I don't know even what you mean. I don't even register bank holidays. It's one thing I'm really bad for in my no, team. No, 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 no. Like, now I've, I've, I've had a couple of burnout trips or close burnout. <laughs> bank holiday is bank holiday. I'll take that. And I, I need to be much better at it because the reality is I forget they exist. And then so I put a meeting in someone's diary and they just feel like very like violated by it. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Um, but no, so like... The um, so the so listening and understanding the local market, understand what the need is. And in that time, we did kind of different collaborations. We did some consultancy work with the University of Ghana and Imperial College London on the ecosystem and what support was needed. And so we, we did a lot of listening. Mm. Um, 
I, just as a side note, in terms of UK revenue coming in, um, I wasn't really paid by the business for the first two years of our journey, not really. We paid our team before we started paying ourselves. And that was really important. I never wanted my financial situation to be a burden on the business in the beginning. And I think that that's that can be really hard for a lot of people starting up because if you come from a background where you don't have the the reserves to be able to just build a business, you have to work full time mm -hmm. whilst building the business, which is really hard. So moving to Ghana, I say it was for personal reasons and, you know, I say it slightly kind of um, jokingly that it was for a softer life. The reality was that I couldn't afford to live in London and build Foundervine. I needed to be somewhere where I didn't have to pay so much rent. I needed to be somewhere where I could actually just not think about financials and actually just focus on generating the revenue mm. that the business needed to grow. And so that was part of the rationale as well. So we're, we're in Ghana, we're, we're running the programs that we're running, we, we're building the talent pool that we're building. Um, and it's just worked out quite well for us doing it like that and I really do encourage more uh more Ghanaian diaspora more African diaspora to look into opportunities to yes you know maximize op uh, revenue generating opportunities on the continent but also think about how you can actually build the infrastructure that our countries need in order to be globally competitive my brain has gone to like four different places <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm making notes i'm just like one thing is like okay what's the starter kit for for someone wanting to move to africa yes that exactly in 2024 because nice. i've I'm, I'm coming i'm coming home i'm coming home guys coming home i've been around europe turkey netherlands dubai Spain, Middle East. dubai france but we're talking about going home so i'm going caribbean first i'm not from caribbean a little like winter break I like that. but then we're going to come to africa and do a few places um the whole we spoke about it in the podcast but i've decided to become a bit of a nomad so every month half the month in london half the month somewhere else but i think i need to do like one month and africa is going to be a great place so so far i've got zanzibar congo ethiopia on the list south africa and ghana makes sense so if you'd have me there i'd come and co-work in your I office i would be delighted to have you um, there. you are you are genuinely more than welcome to work from our office oh I'll, I'll take that genuinely um and we said we're going to come and do a part two in ghana that's what we actually are mm -hmm. we are going to do that within mm -hmm. the next six months no we will yeah great we actually ha probably have a podcast space in our office Love that. <laughs> Look at there that. we go but what what is a what's the starter kit for the founder right now who's looking to leave because like i'm talking to people that people admire online you know, someone called me yesterday, a well-known VC, um, and she's told me, look, black being black in VC is hard right now. Um, she's got access to hundreds of millions of capital through what they deploy, but she's like, I kind of want to take my, my family to Dubai, or I'm considering Africa. So it's not just the founders, it's a lot of people in the ecosystem looking at it. But uh, yeah, what what is the starter kit with what you know now? What, like, what, do, what do you know now that you wish you knew then mm -hmm. that could help? Not just me, but a few of us who are looking to relocate, even if it's for a month or six months. Like, I, I don't think it's right to assume just go on Airbnb or Booking.com or, yeah. or am I right in assuming I can just package it up that, that four weeks? Is it come just buy my flights, open return and go for two days, get a later land and then book something for a month? How do we approach it? Yeah, I think, I mean, just kind of zooming out from what you're saying, because yes, there is the logistics of everything, which can always be worked out. But I think the first thing I would say is mindset. Mm. You know, number one on the starter kit is have the right mindset going into it. You know, humble yourself, um, number one, uh, because I see a lot of that energy and it frustrates me, especially, you know, my, my Detty December people, you know, really just think through this because, you know, there, there's, there's sometimes a mindset of, I'm coming and you're bringing real London energy and, you know, you're complaining about everything. You're, um, you know, utilizing only kind of foreign outlets and not using kind of local vendors and uh, local locally owned hotels and locally owned restaurants and all of those things. You're getting frustrated at locals for the mm -hmm. things that they have to deal with every day, but that don't align to your worldview. Um, and and then you're kind of snapping in some of the kind of like local attractions, but not necessarily actually investing in the country that you're so proud to to take photos of. 
and then you leave on a British Airways flight. Um, so I would I would say the first thing is mindset. What value did you actually have on that whole trip? You know, what was the actual you know economic contribution of your nothing you've not done anything you've just enjoyed yourself um and i and i don't mean that in a kind of disparaging way or anything like that but i do think it's important to say that we need to approach um our homelands or the the continent you know even if you're not from there um as places that are kind of like the heart of our our progress as a community yeah. at the the heart of our understanding of self and what we can achieve as a people and once you start to see it like that, the, the the game changes. And so I would say that starting with mindset is so important. The second second thing I would say is that, you know, um the the you're gonna find it relatively easy to to get an Airbnb and or and do all of those things. Um but generally things are a bit quite challenging. And so, you know, things like um consistent energy supply that's not always the case and and again humble yourself just understand that that's not always the case um but side note my mum has two airbnbs um and literally it can be so frustrating explaining to people when the power is out that the power is just out you know and then they're like oh but this isn't what i paid for and, and you're just like okay let's just understand where we are <laughs> um and so yeah so understanding that local infrastructure isn't the same as um you know your western country that you're coming from and that you will have to deal with worse roads you will have to deal with um a different level of customer service um and a different level of quality sometimes when it comes to the things that you buy yeah um and the third thing i'd say is that there's just like so much going on so really engage with what's happening in the local ecosystem don't just move to your air-conditioned hotel, to your air-conditioned Airbnb, to your air-conditioned restaurant, to your air-conditioned like beach party. Um, actually engage with the local community, actually engage with local activities going on and just be very present. So after you've done that, you're in a very sudden headspace and you're there to kind of give as much as you're receiving. If you're interested in doing business on the continent, um, it takes people some time to see you as someone who is staying. That's one thing I realized, you know, there's lots of people who move back and forth and they'll come and they'll have a meeting with you. Locals don't really care for your energy. They actually sometimes get really triggered by Westerners who think they can't, they're coming and they, they know everything. They're bringing uh, something, an idea that's better than something that exists locally. It can be very triggering and so, knowing that just spending more time mm -hmm. can be really important in terms of building trust means yeah. that it's not just that month you're coming. Your first month might actually just be a relationship building trip. The next time you come will be an opportunity to, to really deepen those relationships and see where you can find gaps that exist to fill mm -hmm. instead of thinking that you're creating something. Because I, I promise you, it already exists. Yeah. I love that. That's love powerful. That. Very, very powerful. And um, I hear you speak about Ghana and it, I'm I'm so fond of the country. Um, I'm from Ethiopia myself, but I've always wanted to go to Ghana because I'd read up on the history and some of the leaders like Kwame and Karuma. And when I got the chance to go to Accra uh, in 2019, I was like, whoa. I said, you're talking about all those things, but I was like, Ghana's, Ghana's way more developed than my country. I was like, you're not going good. I said, you're not going good in Ghana, but... I wanted to talk about like the diaspora, um, people that come from different kind of African sort of countries and kind of backgrounds. So someone like BJ, for example, you're Congolese, but you're, you're coming to Ethiopia. We might go to Kenya. We're going to go to Ghana. Like what kind of advice or what thoughts do you have around the diaspora kind of um, chatting within themselves and, and working together to uplift Africa as a continent? Um, rather than just like individual countries? Or do you think of it more from like an ind individual country perspective? I love the idea of what you're doing and spending time in different countries and understanding 
um, for the synergies that exist. Um, there is so much more that holds us together than separates us. And, um, you know, not to get too deep into the historical context yeah. of separating us. Um, yeah, get as deep as but, you can. <laughs> but, you know, you know we, are, we are products of an extremely successful European project to um, divide and conquer us. Us three sitting here in London today are um, outcomes. And uh, the, the crisp British accents that we're speaking with are outcomes. Quintessential <laughs> British. <laughs> we're very, God save the king. <laughs> um, we are product sitting here of a fantastic, um, fantastically successful colonial uh, uh, experience. And, you know, you mentioned Kwame Nkrumah, the, the, the grandfather of um, Ghanaian pan-Africanism of, you know, um, what African socialism looked like and, you know, Nkrumah is a hero for so many people. And I think that when I when I think about the the way that uh, just even the logistics works, it's it's sometimes it's it's crazy. Yeah. So I, I travel a lot between London and Ghana and it takes me about eight hours door to door to get from my house in London to my house in Accra. It is very easy to travel between London and Accra. Um, in terms of calling London, it's actually not that expensive. Now, tell me what I would have to do to travel to Ethiopia yeah. from, from Accra. If I was going to Addis, like how long would it take me to get there? How, what would I have to do? How many airlines would I have to take? If I wanted to give you a call and say, hey, I'm coming through, how expensive would that call be? You know, there is there is a complete lack of connectivity and there have been really, really great moves to change that in terms of um, ECOWAS and bringing together um, West African states and, you know, the um, African Union and the work that they do to bring um, economies together and allow more frictionless um, trade and, and commerce and all of that. But it's so it's so far away from being integrated. And so again, just going back to the diaspora piece, how brilliant is it that the three of us, are, are the son of Congolese immigrants, the son of Ethiopian immigrants, the child of Ghanaian immigrants can be sitting here talking about our desire to spend more time on the continent. We absolutely need to leverage that. Um, when I, one of the, the triggers for, for starting Foundervine and that made me quit my job in, in 2017 um, was the opportunity to do a TEDx talk. And I did a TEDx talk on the future of entrepreneurship, Africa, inclusion. And one of the things I said is that there are three types of people who are going to shape the African continent. There is the, um, the, the I can't remember what I call them, but the, the entrepreneurs who are doing incredible things on the ground and building really interesting stuff, despite a lot of the challenges that they have. And then there is the the returnee, so the the people just like us who have the opportunity to bring experience, either studying or working or living abroad, and bring new knowledge and new understandings to the continent. And then there's the expat, the people who are not African by descent, but who bring an interest and a passion for the continent, and who bring knowledge and resources, particularly capital that can be invested. And it's that kind of, that that triangle between those three types of people I truly believe are gonna shape the continent for years to come. Africa's gonna have the, you know, the, the, the largest um, population of young people in the world um, right. by 2050. Nigeria's gonna have more young people than like any other country in the world by 2050. Um, and we need to be leveraging that. And it sometimes it makes me sad how little I see our politicians on the, on the continent actually leveraging that, taking a very short termist perspective rather than looking at the long term. But I honestly think that despite that, I'm seeing just such interesting things happening in terms of that, that kind of triangle of people, that pyramid of people really coming together to make change despite um, the lack of interest from our governments and despite the lack of um, you know, economic interest from the rest of the world, I'm still seeing amazing things happening. So, yeah. We love that. Um, segue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. We went deep there in Africa, I went deep there in your career. Um, I don't think you're finished. You know, you did management consultancy, 
You're on the founder by mission now. You've started your own award show. I'm expecting the award show to go around the world maybe at this point, like Blue Sky's thinking. Are there things that you look at in the future that excite you that you still want to go and do? So I'd like to hear from Seb as well. But some stuff I'm looking at um, is being a film director, telling stories, short films. So we're actually producing free documentaries. We're not waiting for them to fund it. Like, let's go do it. Because people, I know that's like MVP model. You make MVP, get interest, you show your results. So I'm looking at directing. I really would love to do something around psychology and anthropology at some point, as studying people and helping people is freaking fascinating to me. Um, how about you? When you look at the future, yeah. when you think about Izzy 40, Izzy 50, but just away from that, just the pots of things that you want to go delve in and, and help, and we're not holding you to account to do it, but we just want to have it on record. So when we come back and interview you and you've done it, we're like, oh, you remember when you told us we'd do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, before I say that, I'd love to hear from you, Seb, what your vision looks like for the future. No, no pressure. Oh, wow. Um, I definitely, this is part of my vision, creating a media property and an asset that not only our generation, but future generations can look upon and see like the stories of entrepreneurs and Yo, BJ, Izzy and Seb, they all linked up in Africa and they've created this amazing thing that's changing things on the continent. For me, I definitely think I look at it regionally and I definitely think that when I look at the future and what really excites me, it's it's in a different continent and it's most likely going to be Africa because when I think about the time that I've spent here, I'm, I wouldn't say it's saturated like that, but I feel like the current economic climate I feel like the potential for growth when I'm really zooming out and looking at like 50 years into the future, I feel like that's where things are sort of starting to happen. So for me, um, one of the things that I'm looking to do next year is to help my mom set up a salon in Ethiopia. She just finished, she's just about to finish her course. She just went back to college. I did a little episode with her as well where she studied being a beautician. So I want to set up like a brick and mortar business in Africa next year, just to see how that kind of goes. But bigger term vision is like something around talent. I really liked what you're talking about, like talent and like digital talent and, and bringing sort of um, Africa and the population into, to, to leapfrog in a way using like technology. I, I, I think what happens if you put like a, a Starlink Wi-Fi sort of router in the middle of a village in Ethiopia, in the middle of 10,000 villages, mm -hmm. like how would that kind of like change things and change the way people are thinking? So yeah, and then another one actually is green energy because um, Ethiopia has a lot of um, blackouts. Ghana has a lot of mm -hmm. blackouts. Everywhere, like energy is like a huge problem. Like, a lot of people don't realize it because we're so used to the lights being on here and everything running 24 seven, but like energy is like a huge thing. So those are like the kind of areas that, that interest me for the future. I love the sound of that. And I, I love the sound of also starting a, a brick and mortar business um, in Ethiopia as well. Where is your family from? Addis. Okay. Um, scattered, but like they all kind of live, live, live in Addis now. But yeah, I'll say Addis. Okay. Um, there's such a need. And as you were speaking, I kind of, um, I was just kind of thinking of the importance of that caveat sometimes of, um, I'm very aware of myself in Accra. I'm very aware of the privilege that I have and the, the space that I occupy that um, someone who's kind of been born and raised in Ghana doesn't occupy. Uh, it's 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 really important for me to kind of uh, acknowledge and respect that that privilege and know that even though I'm facing challenges, I can build infrastructure that kind of really kind of like limits the impact on my life in a way that a lot of people can't on the ground. Um, and so it's even more important uh, that I give as much as I can towards trying to improve that ecosystem for everyone as well as kind of forward my own personal ambitions. Um, and that kind of brings me into, into what my plans are long term. And so um, I, I love what you said about kind of telling stories and using, um, you know, using medium of kind of um, uh, it's like cinema and kind of like film to do that. Um, for me, I'm, I've always been really interested in movements of capital 
And um, I don't know if you know, but I'm a politics graduate. I, I didn't do anything to do with business. I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. I thought I was going to write policy for a living. Um, Gosh, you've definitely been affecting policy in the last 10 years. I, oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's still a long way to go with it as well. And so if the work that we're doing at, at Foundvine at the moment is is very much the kind of micro, so supporting individuals on a, on an, um, on a business by business level, uh, my, my ambitions for the future are definitely kind of more macro in nature. And so what does it mean to actually build a, a a better landscape for entrepreneurs for founders for professionals what does it mean to uh you know uh sort of shift legislation that gets government out of the way in terms of innovating yeah. particularly in emerging technologies what does it mean to uh use policy as a lever to increase the 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 size and um type of capital that's being dispersed to founders in different ways and so i love the idea of doing more work kind of advising at a supranational at a national level um and just doing more work in that space and kind of being as loud and um, I, I kind of like think of myself almost like a, um, a kind of corporate activist at the moment, you know, going into boardrooms, asking them to put their, their money where their mouth is in terms of impact and just doing that at a bigger level. And so movements of capital, um, policy, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of Ghana, I'm really interested, uh, with the, the continent generally as well, in the, um, the positive impact of capital when it comes to direct giving. Mm. So I think direct giving is one of the most powerful ways that we can um, support people to le lead more fulfilling lives. And um, quick, quick pop quiz. How much do you think, I, I don't have this as an official figure. I've been questions, come on. Yeah, yeah, it's not an official figure. It's, it's just more anecdotal. But how much do you think a, um, a teacher earns monthly in Ghana? Just guess. Relative to pounds? Yeah. In pounds. pounds. I'll You've said that you gave us a couple of clues already this episode. Inflation's gone up half the price. I don't think the money was like the same. You also said people have been striking. I, I, I'd vote like about £500 a month. Okay. I would say £300. Okay. Um, it's wow. probably closer to about £120 a month. Wow. Yeah. So we're we're in a space in which the the vast majority of uh the country are earning kind of less than five thousand pounds a year, um, in in equivalent terms. And um what's the, what's the cost for that, that teacher to live? There we go. You're in a country experiencing hyperinflation. That's mm. partly been caused by um, go global uh, challenges and downturn, but it's partly been caused by the fact that there's not been enough investment into local industry mm. over several decades. Ghana imports far more than she exports, and therefore you've got a lot of people who are reliant on, you know, Russian grain or, you know, toothpicks from nigeria or like yeah, you know like know, um actually i <laughs> another pop quiz when inflation was We're really take kind this, of way, jumping quiz. <laughs> quiz. <laughs> block, block quiz block quiz there we go okay you heard it here first guys block quiz um <laughs> but when inflation was jumping around about doing hydraulics um guess how much i bought a uh, a box of crunchy nut for in ghana a tenner Okay, ten pounds. Uh, no, I don't think it's that crazy. I'm thinking like three, three pounds. Export, bro. It's sort of okay, four, it? four pounds. So funny. Four pound fifty. Twelve pounds. Wow. And you bought that? How many boxes did you, you know, buy? I mean, <laughs> how, did you buy? how many boxes that's, did that's you the, buy? I'm, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Actually, now, now it's public record that I'm an idiot because um, why? No, we just, just know eat, you like talk shops. Eat bread. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. But you know, I I was just craving crunchy nut. You know that those moments where you know. you know you're just craving something. I had one in Kenya when I got shipped back to Kenya. What really just kept me like going was like cinnamon toast. These like cinnamon yeah. toast um, cereals, and they cost like four pounds. That was like ten fifteen years ago. Yeah. But I forced my mom to buy. I was like, I don't care. I I want this. You need a taste of home sometimes, mm. and um, it was it was it was inflation was so bad mm. in Accra last year that um, I once went into a supermarket and they'd actually just removed all of the prices 
from the shelves because they were changing so mm. much on a daily basis. It got so bad that I had to I had to pay staff out of my personal bank account because all of the money transfer companies refused to transfer to City because mm. they couldn't understand what the price was doing. It was hard. And so in this country, when people are crying over, you know, 8%, 9%, try 45% inflation. See what that's like to raise a family. That feels like. That so, reminds me of like just where I just come from Turkey recently. I was in Turkey for half of September and I've got a picture where I was there six years ago in 2017 and I um, one pound was six pounds. Or well, six Turkish six. lira. Yeah. How much do you reckon it is now? 10? 20? 28. Oh, wow. Twenty eight. Wow, and it, you talk. We talk about it in like numbers, and so it's just Turkey's, like, oh, Turkey's it's a number. Down the road. Yeah, yeah, but it has real consequences. It it means that if you had, um, if you had ten pounds in your bank account in Turkey, it's actually worth what like fifteen p or something like that now in equivalent terms. Mm -hmm. That level of inflation. Yeah. Inflation, inflation, inflation. Right. How do you relax? What do you do to kind of get you in the zone, like just tuning down? Because we ain't here promoting workaholicness. I know, I know. It's so and even if we are, to... it's the time we're here to remind yeah. our friends, <laughs> life is bigger than getting to the bag sometimes. 100%. Uh, 100%. How do I relax? I, I love spending time with friends. I love kind of like going out and going for drinks and letting my hair down. Um, I think it's so important to just keep a very active social life when you're in a very kind of like high pressured job. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of my relaxing is kind of socializing with friends, kind of unpacking, it's spending time with my husband, it's having kind of date nights and nights in, um, just being kind of very present in terms of quality time with friends and family is how I balance some of the stresses of living between two countries and like running um multiple kind of like uh high powered how high pressured um roles that i do yeah we love that it has been a pleasure to have you on the show thank, thank you. you thank you for having me um guys as always don't forget to like comment and subscribe um if you want to tap in and find out more about how you can join Found the Vine. We'll put details in the description. Um, and please take this as an invitation to come to Found the Vine events, especially the ones abroad. Um, and my takeaway, Seb, is definitely to think about the mindset, you know, as we approach some countries. What, have you, what are some of your takeaways? Inflation, man. Inflation! <laughs> Inflation! <laughs>